Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Uh, we are now going to move into the, um, oh, actually, you know, the, the, what they refer to as the uh, pastoral epistles, and um, which would be Titus, First and Second Timothy. Paul wrote these during his second imprisonment, or you know, after his, after the first imprisonment, and uh, these are the last three letters he wrote. Um, we're, there's debate on whether Titus was written before First Timothy, but they were written around the same time. Okay. Um, so with the debate on that, we, we're just going to go ahead with Titus tonight. We are not going to get all uptight about which one was written first because, you know, uh, 2,000 years later, it's, you know, hard to get the argument over um, which one was actually done when. Okay? So but let's jump in here, and uh, uh, we'll read the first, first verse here. Paul, a servant of God, and, and, and Belinda, this mic's a little hot in the house. I don't think it needs to be turned down for Brother Bill, but it's hot in the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, good, that's good. It just took that little edge off. Hallelujah, thank you. All right. Uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Um, this formal salutation of the letter of Titus is longer than those in other pastoral epistles. Uh, besides its length, additional significant differences are this. Paul called himself a servant of God. Um, used only here and not in any of his other letters, okay? Uh, the content of this greeting is replete with doctrinal terms. The salutation is contained in the first four verses, okay? So we'll read the first four verses, um, which uh, an uh, apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledge of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is commanded unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay, so servant is uh, in the Greek, Greek word doulos, it means slave or servant. The Greek means slave, one who completely belongs to his master with no freedom of his own. Paul referred to himself as one who belonged completely to his master with no freedom of his own. I am a, I'm a slave of Jesus. I'm a servant. I am a, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Well, that's what we are too. We should take on that same thing. We should not approach our relationship with God as one where he's redeemed us from hell and we get to do whatever we want to do. Whoa! Free, that's not freedom, okay? Um, two, okay, the, the word servant is the one who willingly chooses to serve his master. Paul was both a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To claim to apostleship adds to the weight of the letter since an apostle was especially commissioned by Christ. Three important terms are used during these verses. One is faith, I mean the faith, knowledge, and, and godliness. Focus on three practical truths. Faith in scripture means absolute trust in God. God wrote of the faith of God's elect. The elect are believers who make up the church. Added to faith is acknowledging, and that is epinosin, which comes from epinosis, uh, knowledge of truth, glory to God, and godliness is an active reverence toward God. Clearly, faith in God and knowledge of the truth lead to godliness. Amen. So we, the, we, and there's some stuff in this letter, I, you know, because Paul is writing to a pastor telling him what to teach. We would do well to see what God, what Paul, anointed by the Holy Ghost, was encouraged to tell his young protege what to teach. Titus, is one, Titus and Timothy were a couple, two of his pastors. They were protégés of Paul's. They were, in other words, he was, he was their spiritual father, as it were, overseeing their development and training and helping them walk in the right places, okay? As they led the church. All right, hallelujah. An another virtue uh, listed here in verse, in chapter, in verse two is um, in hope of eternal life. No, oh, going it, I'm sorry. Dag nabbit. Dag nabbit. Hallelujah. The, uh, the cable got hooked up in the body pack and then unplugged it from my 
shirt collar and this aggravating. That kind of messes things up. All right. Another virtue is hope. In the Bible, it is a firm assurance and expectation, not wishful thinking. You know, it's not twinkle, twinkle, little star. All right? It is a firm assurance and expectation. Okay? Here it is anchored in eternal, anchored in eternal life promised by God who cannot lie. He stands in contrast to the Cretans, who, are, who were, and that's where Titus is, who were habitual liars. Okay, before the world began is literally before time eternal. Okay, so and we stand in hope of eternal life promised before the world began. Remember what John the Baptist uh, said about Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Remember that? So eternal life was promised before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. The word due times, but in due times manifested as word due time contrast before the world began. In the previous verse, the plural uh, in the Greek, could refer to various times or as a collective singular to a particular time. Um, the NIV translates it, this appointed season. His word is the authoritative message that centers in Jesus Christ, the gospel. Manifested means brought to light and emphasizes the clear proclamation or preaching of the gospel. This ministry was committed, that is, to be entrusted with to Paul. Um, praise God. Three times in Titus, you, Paul uses the phrase, uh, God our Savior. Now, verse 4, Titus was a Greek and a valuable co-worker of Paul. <coughs> Paul called his, him as his own son, or genuine, true son. This word was also used to Timothy over 1 Timothy 1, 2, suggests Titus was coveted under Paul's ministry. And the common faith is the faith shared by all believers. So Paul's uh, opening salutation here was a little bit different. And, um, you know, established things. Number one, Titus is, is, is coveted, beloved. Um, that the, uh, the acknowledging of the truth leads to godliness. We need to understand godliness is part of the walk with God. Amen? There's a, there's a verse in here to get in chapter 2 I wish we could go ahead and get to, but I can't. I'll get there. Hallelujah. Now, for this cause left I thee at Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And now, I, I, what I read to you out of those first four verses is out of the complete biblical library uh, was published by World Library Press, out of print. Now it is on a, you can't get an electronic version, but it's out of print. Um, but, that, you know, that's, that's who gets credit for all that. I wouldn't, that wasn't me, it was them. Hallelujah. For this cause, now verse 4, well, I, 5, I left thee at Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. <clears throat> so Paul was leaving, he had, to set, he had to put somebody in charge, and he put somebody he trusted, to go into the different cities in that region of Crete and or, or set elders in charge. Hallelujah. Right, you just can't, you've got to have somebody that people are, are, are answering to. They just run wild if they don't. You put them out there by themselves and they'll just run wild. Well, if they're Christians, grace is going to make them do it. That's not what Paul did. He set somebody in charge to set people in charge to have oversight over what was going on. Why? Because people, if they don't, if they don't get taught, if they don't get, have discipline, and remember the word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. The word of God will do all those things. Amen. And we have to have that working in our lives. And we have to have someone overseeing that. You know? Um, and there's, there, the, the pastor in the local church, or in, that, in this day, sometimes there's just older people who are more mature that could keep the, the, the young renegades in check. Hallelujah. You know, um, so, we're, you know, we're sitting here. I'm the pastor of this church. Do you say you might want to call it my church? Well, it's not my church. It, it's the, the, where God has set me. All right. So I have the authority here as the local pastor. I answer to the, the chief pastor, the head, the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have spiritual leaders over me. But, you know, we, we are here to teach the word of God with correction for doctrine, for reproof and instruction in righteousness. All those things are there, and the, and the purpose of them is to help you. Amen. Did you know doctrine helps you? Did you know instruction and in righteousness helps you? Did you know correction helps you? Now, not if you don't receive it, but it still helps you. It will, receive, it will work if you, if you receive it. And then, you know, re, uh, uh, reproof, which is even worse, it's stronger than correction. Reproof is a stronger word. Okay. So, um, so Paul gives Titus a twofold assignment here. He's to appoint uh, ministers in different places and, and set things in order, to keep things set in order. You just can't get together and have a free-for-all. 
I've heard people say over the years, well, we don't have, we don't believe in pastors. We just have house church. You're not, we're following the New Testament example. Really? The Bible put elders in charge. Now, when the, the, when the church first started, they didn't have, you know, you just, you didn't have pastors everywhere. You had to put some older guys. Like I said, older guys in charge to keep, to keep things under, under control. And what were they supposed, what was the charge that T Titus was given when he set these elders in charge? To, to keep, set things in order. Keep order. You got to have order. The church is not a free-for-all. It's not a party. I disagree. We got, no, no, we, we, no, that worshiping God and being rejoicing in the Lord and having, um, having joy in the presence of God is not a party. Unbridled. Do whatever you want to do. All right. Um, these objectives, well, you know, and of course, uh, the Cretes had a bad reputation <laughs> throughout the Mediterranean. Um, so they followed the two patterns that he had set forth, uh, set in order, okay? The things that are wanting, unfinished or defective, and, um, you know, put the elders in charge. It's synonymous with the word bishop or presbyterus, which we get presbytery from. Let's down, go on down here. Verse 6, because now he sets forth the, the qualifications of these men that are going to be elders and in many cases actually become pastors. If anyone be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Okay, so verses 6 through 9 contain a list of qualifications of elders. It's similar to the list that he gave over in 1 Timothy. He must be blameless or irreproachable. Um, the emphasis is placed on the family life of an elder. Uh, it's, that seems to be prerequisite in spiritual things of an overseer of a church. You've got to have your family life in order. Okay? You can't have uh, your sons running up and down the street uh, as a pimp, selling drugs, you know, all over the place. You've got to have your house, your house in order. Okay? Your wife can't be a, the, the, the neighborhood harlot. All right? I mean, I'm just, listen, you've got to have your husband of one wife. He's an older man who is married and does not categorically, uh, this does not categorically exclude a single man, but, uh, and this doesn't really necessarily just restrict wife, uh, marriage to a second wife if the previous wife is deceased. It has the prime meaning of a faithful monogamous, uh, monogamous, monogamous marriage, okay? You know, in other words, you're not, you're not uh, got six wives, you know, you're, you're not out in Utah and you got four wives, okay, or whatever. Uh, the word faithful should be uh, understood as believing, having believing children. The two negatives here are meaningful because of the lifestyle of the Christians. An elder's children must not be choosed of, and, and, and the Greek word is estosius, and it means debauchery, dissipation, profligacy, uh, man, these are profligacy, see, and wild extravagance. In other words, they can't be rampant wild animals, just going up and down, just living, just living like harlots and I mean, man, whores, and everything else. Just, just say it like it is. Your kids can't be running around like that if you're going to be in, in the ministry. They've they got to have a lifestyle that, that honors God. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, the term is used in Luke 15, 13 of the prodigal son. The elder's children must not be unruly, undisciplined, disobedient, rebellious, or insubordinate. All right. The word bishop, synonymous with elders, can be translated overseer and suggest responsibility. Steward of God conveys the idea of a manager of a household of a state. The overseer or steward of God's household, that is the local church, must not be overbearing or arrogant. The idea here is a man of you know, conceit, intolerant, arrogant, stubbornness, contemptuous. Uh, Orgleon, that's quick-tempered or inclined to anger. Uh, par paranoian, uh, given to overindulgence in wine. Um, Plucking, not violent, no striker, not ready to come to blows. And then the last one here is a, a filthy lucre, fond of dishonest gain. Denotes a man who does not care how he gets the money so long as he gets it. Okay? Uh, then he goes on and begins talking about you've got to be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. You know, um, sober, just, 
holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught. We've got to be faithful to the word of God. Amen? Sound doctrine that occurs eight times in the pastoral epistles uh, means correct teaching. He'll be able to exhort, that is encourage or edify. Convince. That is refute, convict, point out, rebuking in a convincing way the gainsayers, that, those who oppose sound doctrine. Now we have people right now in the church who are, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to uh, someone the other day. You know, a lot of the stuff that's happening with what we are now referred to as hyper grace or crazy grace or gre greasy gracers, or extra, uh, they're doing the same thing that a lot, of, a lot of people did with faith back in the 70s and 80s. They would say, I can have what I say. By faith, I can have what I say. You know, and, and uh, you know, there was a book out called you can, you know, Having Faith in Your Faith. And I almost had you can have what you say. But if you read the book, you found out that the, the author put limitations on having what you say. What are those limitations? You can't have what God don't promise. But they take Mark 11, 24, who's, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, and you'll have them. And they run out the deep end. They start confessing other people's husbands, other people's wives, start confessing their houses, their cars, start confessing just crazy stuff. Well, the interesting thing is there are the words, there's a couple of words in that passage. Well, what things soever you desire comes from the Greek word to mean lust. When you pray, that comes from the Greek word to ask. Okay? Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. When you go to James, and those same Greek words are used over in James, I believe, chapter 4, where it says you have not because you ask not, saying ateo, A-I-T-E-O, same Greek word, pray over Mark eleven twenty four. You have not because you ask not. Well, if you just stop there, hey, you got to ask God, you got to believe me, preach a whole sermon on asking. But then it goes on right after that and says this, or you ask amiss, wrongly. Why? That you may consume it upon your own lust. Same word for desire in Mark eleven twenty four. So there is a governing factor that you got two verses. One says that you're, if you ask wrongly to consume it on your own lust, the other says whatever you desire you can have if you ask for it. What? Well, then that seems to be contradictory. No. So you go and then you find out that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The, the tempering, and some people say balance is compromise. It's not compromise. It is not compromise you the whole counsel of the word of God to get a full picture. That's not compromise. No, it messes up your, your crazy theology is what it does. You know, where you, where you mis, misconstrue. Or as Peter said, there are people who are unlearned who do rest the scriptures. <coughs> so, if it's not Bible, biblical, then you can't have it. You can have what you say as long as it's in line with the word of God. You can't have somebody else's wife. Why? God hates divorce. As a matter of fact, God says if you look on a, a, another woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. So there are, there are tempering scriptures to brash statements that we like to make. Okay? We like to make the statement, I can have what I say. And people run out the door with that and start confessing just stupid stuff that the Bible doesn't promise them. See, we've done the same thing now. We, we jump up 30 years, we got into now teaching on grace, and people are doing the same thing. They're saying things like, Jesus is grace. You know, and they're just taking scriptures. This, and I'll get to that scripture. It's over, it's over in Titus 2, they use that. For the grace of God uh, the unto salvation hath appeared unto all men. And they say, that's Jesus appeared to us. He's grace. Jesus is grace. Somebody even got out the other day and said, God's your father and grace is your mother. Like, you better stop smoking that Rastafarian wacky weed, what you need to stop doing. Hello. Are y'all here? You go home. What verse am I in? Oh, verse 9. Holding fast uh, the faithful word. Amen. So we need to be correct teaching. And then we need to point out, refute, refute. Now listen, uh, people get on me because they say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't teach that stuff. All you need to talk about is love. He told Timothy, I mean Titus, to refute, to rebuke in a convincing way, to uh, convict and to point out those, the gainsayers, those who oppose sound doctrine. That is a Bible command to pastors. Well, I don't think you should do it. Well, I don't answer to you. I answer to the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't like it, I can't help it. This is his command to me and to all pastors. That when people don't have sound doctrine, we are to point it out. Well, I just wish you would stop teaching on that and just stay, and just stay with you know, the stuff we like. I can't just give you the stuff you like. I'm going to have to point out the gainsayers 
who bring unsound doctrine into the church. Why? Because if you don't get it pointed out, you'll swallow it and go ahead and act on it. If Pastor Ed would just stop teaching on that stuff and just teach faith, it would be wonderful. Well, I'll tell you what. You get first, uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 9 taken out of the Bible and I'll stop. Have Jesus remove it and I'll stop. I have a responsibility. Now, it's not just a responsibility. I'm commanded to do that. Well, you're just being mean. You're being this. You're being that. No, 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 no. See, people don't understand the calling of the pastor. They watch television. They see the big, the big man. I, I, I'm, I love a lot of those guys. A lot of those guys are just awesome people. Okay? Awesome ministries. Some of them is why I got to where I was in God. Okay? But the, the ministry of the pastor is different than any of the other ministry gifts. Except more in line with the apostle because the apostle was really the pastor to the pastors. And overseer of the church, he oversaw the churches as a whole. The local pastors oversaw the local assemblies. He would pastor the pastors. I know there's other things in his ministry, but, there's, but the, the, the kind of authority they carry, pastors have to do things. That's why Paul, as the apostle, told the young pastor, here's what you've got to do. I'm telling you, as the apostle, the, the, the highest authority uh, of man in the church to tell the local pastor, here's what you've got to do. So it's not a responsibility, it's a command. It's not just, I'm going to say it's not just a responsibility or not something we think is cool. I'll be honest with you. See, and see the traveling ministry, the, the evangelist, well, what does he preach? He preaches Jesus crucified and saved, and, and he'll save you. It's not his job. It is it's not his job in ministry to disciple the converts. He's getting them saved. The traveling teacher brings teaching to the church, but a lot of times they want to teach what's, what, you know, the, the, uh, the, the fun stuff. They get to come in. I've, have, I've had traveling teachers come in and sit here and teach. And I, three weeks before that, I taught a two-week two sermon. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. On exactly what they taught. And people come up to him after church. I've never heard it like that before. And I'm standing there with my mouth open. Did you? But, you know, they got it. So, you know, you know I think, I just got through teaching that. <coughs> he came in and... <laughs> in a teaching way, taught it in a way that, that, that helped put things in them. That, that's their job. And in most cases, and, and, very, and, and highly likely most cases, they don't come in and rebuke. They don't correct. Sometimes when they leave, the pastor has to get up and straighten it out. Sometimes they say stuff that you got to get behind them. Go, ah. Why? It's the job of the pastor. To make sure that sound doctrine is in the midst. And if people bring an unsound doctrine in, they have a responsibility and a command from the head of the church to deal with it. <clears throat> now, I can't help it if you don't like that. You know what? There are days I don't like it. There are days I wish I didn't have to. There are days I wish I could just go, whoop, praise God, we're going to have what we say. Thank God we all have a million. Everybody stand there and confess I got a million dollars. I'm going to give it. Come on up here and stuff money in my shirt and pants pockets. Glory to God, and you'll get rich because you're going to give to the higher anointing. Whoa, praise God. Let's all go home. You go home broke, I go home rich. But you're going to get your money. You're, God's going to bless you because you did it. Boy, that would be fun as the pastor. Every time I had a little extra, a need, a little extra need, praise God, it's, it's, it's a thousandfold anointing tonight. Come on up and give to me. You'll get blessed. But see, my job is to take unsound doctrine and make sure it's not out there in the church. Number one, there's no such thing as a thousandfold anointing. Amen. We don't preach for, for gain. We preach for the, because we're called. Now, the, there's, there's, you know, see, now, the other side of it is, you don't muzzle out the ox and the tread out the corn. You, make, you, know, you take care of the... The, those that minister, but I'm, I'm saying when we start preaching things and, and all of a sudden we're getting rich off the way we preach it, that we got to watch it. And that's, that's my job as the pastor. Say, hey, look, if you go to this meeting and somebody gets up <coughs> and God didn't tell you to do something like that, don't you follow just because somebody else did it in the church. I've been in meetings where one person stood up and went up and put money on the platform and everybody started doing it. Why? And you could feel the pressure only because somebody else did it or you even thinking about doing it. It had nothing to do with God speaking to you. So you want to make sure you didn't look unspiritual. 
Well, you know what your reward will be? It won't be a hundredfold return. It won't be a thirtyfold return. It won't be a sixtyfold return. It'll be you don't feel unspiritual. Because that's why you gave. So you got your reward. That was what your faith was in. Getting the pressure of unspirituality off of you. So, um, we are to refute, convict, point out, and rebuke in a convincing way the gainsayers, those who oppose sound doctrine. Okay, let's move into verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Now, Paul, everywhere Paul dealt, went, he had to deal. See, he's, think about this. Now, how many letters now have we read where Paul had to deal with the Judaizers? We just did it over in um, Colossians. He was dealing with the Judaizers. We know here he's dealing with Judaizers. Galatians, he dealt with the Judaizers. Why? Because that was an issue in the church in that day he had to constantly deal with. Things go in cycles. So now, we, we've had past few years a lot of, a lot of excess and, and extreme and out-of-balance teaching on grace that that's just not biblical. And because we're dealing with it, people get mad with you. And Paul didn't do that. Oh, give me a stinking break. This is the third letter that I just quoted that he, went, he wrote and t told them, and these are regional letters. Okay, Paul's writing to Timothy, a pastor in an area. He's setting elders in all over that area, and he's telling them that there are people that, you know, watch out for the, for the circumcision, the Judaizers. He did it to the Galatians. He did it to the Colossians. And I'm sure if we went and digging further, we could find he did it in other places. He's writing letters all in the same time frame, 62 and 63 and 64 A.D., he, and he, it's this theme keeps coming up in his letters. So you people who are always getting on preachers for dealing with stuff that's in error, why don't you do a little bit better study and get rid of your haughty, you know everything attitude. You know more than the pastors, you know more than the preachers. And settle down and listen because they're doing it for your soul to help you, to save you from destruction, to save you from horrible, horrible consequences for bad decisions or for getting involved in something. That you don't need to be getting involved in. Okay? The false teachers were unruly, rebellious, and insubordinate. That's what the word meant. Um, the, uh, the second one here was they were, they were what? Um, they were unruly. They were vain talkers. That, that meant that they were um, empty-headed blabberers. It's too bad that the King James didn't translate it the way that it really meant. Empty-headed blabberers. Okay? And deceivers. What? misleaders just because someone calls the name of Christ does not mean they have your good good and best interest at heart let's go on, I'll prove it to you whose mouths listen to this must be stopped muzzled silenced bridled why because they're bright they're, they're they are subverting that is ruining upsetting and overturning Whole houses. Teaching things that they ought not. Why? For filthy lucre's sake. Dishonest gain. You're just being, you're not walking in love when you say people are doing things so they can sell books. Paul said it. You know, people, how many have heard Paul's the preacher of grace? And he was. He preached grace. But he didn't just stop there. He's, he's dealing with people who are going to hurt the church. Amen? And he said that, <clears throat> that these, these mouths, what? Must be stopped. Why? Because he loved the people more than he loved his own uh, reputation of, or, or, or whatever. People will say all kinds of stuff about you. They'll say all kinds of evil about you. You know, it was somebody posted on my wall, Julie Tucker, uh, Jack Sparrow running from in one of the, the movies with all the, the, the uh, he's on the beach and they're all chasing down, you know, and, uh, and he says, be a pastor, they said. It would be fun, they said. <laughs> he's running, you know, crazy. Hi, crazy. <coughs> Hallelujah. Be a pastor, they said. It'd be fun, they said. People say all kinds of evil about you, but you know what? When you're called, you have a responsibility and a command to do what God said to do. And there are people out there who do it who preach things, and they won't preach the truth. They'll preach what people want to hear. They'll manipulate the scripture. They'll do things because they want 
to have the gain of filthy lucre. And Paul said their mouths must be stopped. Everybody said their mouths must be stopped. Hallelujah. One of them, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own said, the Cretans are always liars. Evil beasts and slow bellies. This is what Paul said. No, we need to walk in love. No, he said, this witness is true. <coughs> People who come along and say, we just preach love, we just preach love, don't read Paul. They read the part they like, but they don't read the whole. He said, one of their own prophets said that they're liars, evil beasts, and um, what was the other thing? Slow bellies. And Paul goes, you got it right. <laughs> this witness is true. Wherefore, just preach love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Not what he say? Rebuke them sharply. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. See, the end is what we're after. We're in, the end is sound faith. The end is not walking in, walking contrary to wholesome doctrine. The end is that they grow up in Christ. Amen? It is not that they all just get together and talk about how wonderful you are. Amen? Just love the way you preach because you never, you never make me feel bad. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have days you come to church and this message is going to be preached and you're going to feel bad because you're not doing what the Bible says. And the choice is make a change or get mad at the preacher. They call Paul names. Did y'all know that? They, they had a dis, there were churches that had a disdain for Paul and he said, look, I might, be, I might be small in stature, but I'm the apostle. All right? I mean, he had to rebuke them for taking that mindset. So he says here, um, this witness is true. They're liars. They're, they're uh, evil, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Now rebuke them sharply. Not because he hated them. His purpose was so that it would be sound in faith. The rebuke was to snatch them out of living contrary to wholesome doctrine so they could be sound in faith. That is love. Hello? I don't know. People, you, got, you have got to get it. You've got to stop listening to the sloppy agape crowd. That love is telling you you can get away with anything you want and go to heaven. That is not love. That is not love. Bible tells us in the Old Testament, if you don't spank your, if you, you, you spare the rod, you hate your child. Well, love would never hit your child. No, love spanks your child to tell them you can't get away with that. It's bad behavior. It'll cost you in the long run. We need a redefinition of love. And it is not do whatever you want and I'll still love you. I will love you, but I'm not going to let you get away with it. Not as long as you're here. Now, if, you, if you're not here, I'm not going to say anything to you except this way. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure. Unto, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess, they know God, but listen to this. But in works, woo, that's the plural of a four-letter word. But in works, deny him, being abominable and disobedient. And unto every good work, listen to this, reprobate. Now, how people come along and go, we, we, we don't, no. you don't work to get saved. But I'm telling you, after you get saved, there should be works in your life that demonstrate salvation is working in you. Instead of you continuing to live the way you did and calling it that you're under, you're under some kind of special thing called grace where it doesn't matter. You know, the love of God's going to make me do whatever. The love of God didn't make you do, any, do anything. You love God. You follow after God. But you, you know, and you do things because you love God, but the love of God does not make you do. God doesn't make anybody do anything. There is nothing automatic about your walk with the Lord. Now, I, was listening, I heard somebody recently and saw some things they said. You know, they, they just, you know, there's no cost to pay to serve God. You know, I just, you know, because I'm saved and love God, I do everything because I love God. That's wonderful. 
I know some people that there's some things in their life that's hard to do. Did you know Jesus appeared to Paul and told him what great things he must suffer for his name's sake? And he went over and one of the, into the church at Corinth and listed a bunch of them. But thou, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, speak the things which become sound doctrine. Oh my. We have to be men and women who are after, you know, sound doctrine. So Paul's now contrasting Titus with the false teachers that are in the area. But thou, these are people who are evil. They're, 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 um, they're not pure. They, they profess no God. They have, they're reprobate when it comes to evil works. But you... But you, now, what's this? This isn't just, you know, well, since they're doing it, just go with the flow. This is, but you, Titus, but, thou, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, Paul begins to give a definition of things that are sound, sound doctrine, okay? Um, that the aged men be sober, sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The aged women, likewise, that they in behavior become holiness, not behavior as holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. <coughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. They're, they're to have, they're, they're, you know, slander and drunkenness are two vices that were practiced among Christian women. So he dealt with that. You gotta be, you can't be around drinking all the time, sitting around the house drinking. You know? Well, I have a glass of wine with my dinner. Yeah. And then you have one at lunch. It starts out with a dinner wine. Then next thing you know, you're drinking all the, all the time. Every time you feel a little whatever, you just need a little relaxation, get a glass of different kind. Always drinking. All right? Um, not giving them much wine. Teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, Obedient to their own husbands. Now, we always like to add this because of the, the way, day and age we live in. When you're obeying your husband, you're obeying him in the things of God. You don't have to do things that violate the word. You don't have to get beat. You don't have to have sex with other men because it turns him on. Oh, there's crazy people. There's the women, the women going to counseling for pastors. So my husband wants me to have sex with other men while he watches. That's, you don't have to do that, women. That's not being obedient to your husband. He's violating the word of God. And he's misusing the daughter of God. And you're not bound by any scriptural practice to obey him in that. No, you obey your husband in the things of God. No, no man has the right over his wife to make her do things that are contrary to, to the word of God. See, listen, you think I'm crazy? I've, I've been told by people. I don't make this stuff up. That went over good. Obedient to the home own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young women, likewise, uh, young men, likewise, Tim Titus, you exhort them to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he is of the contrary may, part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient to their masters, to please them in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing good fidelity. They may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Now, here's the scripture. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, there are people, it says, that it, it appeared, Jesus appeared, therefore he is grace. The word... The word appeared here means to light, to shine. The grace of God has shined to all men. It's not, it's not, it, is not a, it is not a scripture that tells us Jesus is grace. It's kind of like, you know, people say love is God. You know, grace is Jesus. So you get messed up. But let's get, let's just pass that. For the grace of God that bringeth, men, bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. What? So the, the grace of God teaches us. That deny ye ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
Now I just messed up a whole lot of crazy stuff on grace. And here's the thing. There are people who teach grace and teach it excellent. Teach it sound. And, I mean, actually one of the best teachers you'll hear on the subject is Guy Dunnick. Excellent. Tony Cook has a great book on grace, The DNA of God. But you hear people, I hear people saying things like, you know, because I'm under grace, it doesn't matter what I do, you know, if I'm, I'm, I can just do this. He says here the grace teaches us to deny. Not, listen, it doesn't automatically happen. It teaches us to deny ungodliness. Okay? Refute it. And what? Worldly lust. Why? We should, and, and, and listen, it teaches us to live a certain way, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what it teaches us to do. It doesn't teach us that whatever we do is okay because we're under grace. And any effort of our part is works and the law and therefore it's not of God. That's not what grace teaches us. If you would just read your Bible. All of it. Not just the parts you like. And leave out the parts that go... Con That's why people start saying, you know, well... We really don't need to read Peter and James because they don't, they, they don't agree with Paul's teaching on grace. I've heard people say it. I've, I've seen it written. We need to go find a Bible where 1 John 1, 9 isn't in the Bible because we never repent when we sin. Because it's already forgiven. And when they found two Bibles that, that all scholars agree that 1 John 1, 9, no they don't. All biblical scholars don't agree. Shouldn't be in the Bible. Hello? So Paul's dealing with Judaizers here. He's dealing with crazy stuff. So we're to live a certain way. Grace teaches us. I always say grace teaches. What does it truth teach us? First, the negative. You deny ungodliness. You deny worldly lust. You should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now let's, let's take this in light of the parable of the ten virgins. Remember this, the parable of the ten virgins? They were ten virgins. The bridegroom was getting ready, and the ten virgins were, uh, of the bridal party were, were, um, were, were out getting ready, and uh, five of them brought their lamps full of oil, their wicks ready and lit, um, and the five foolish ones came with nothing. And the, and the Bible says the bridegroom tarried. But then the call came, late, I guess in the midnight hour or whatever, he tarried, but then the call came, and, the, and they all hopped up to go, and the five foolish virgins looked to the five ones who had made preparation and said, lend us some of your oil so we can go. And they said, if we give you the oil, we won't have enough for us. You should have brought enough. Okay? In other words, your lack of preparation has cost you a, caused you a problem. In other words, you weren't living, looking. Had, it's like somebody said, you know, with the blood moon, you know, uh, had, had they known exactly when the bridegroom was coming out, they'd have been ready. But they were just kind of being lackadaisical because he tarried. And the Bible tells us as the church, we're to be looking for the glorious appearing, <clears throat> I mean the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it mean? We're to be ready. You can't be living ungodly and be ready. You can't be living unrighteously and be ready. Are you here? You can't be living in ungodliness and worldly lust and be ready for the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul says, grace teaches us, and he's telling Titus, the, the, the under pastor, to be teaching people that grace teaches us we're to deny ungodliness, we're to deny worldly lust, we're to be sober, we're to live righteous, we're to live godly in this present world looking. <coughs> you can't be out with somebody else's wife and be looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus. Because somebody told you you get to go to heaven no matter what. Hello? You can't be looking for his appearing if you're doing that. Can I get a grunt? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us what? From all iniquity 
and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Purchased people, that word peculiar means zealous, zealous, zealous of what? Look up there. Are you getting it? What is he zealous of? Good works. Now this is what Paul tells Titus. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Wow. Yeah, Pastor Ed, if you would just teach on love all the time, we'd have a bigger church. You know what? I got to do what I'm supposed to do and let God take care of the rest. Hello. Do you know there was a time in Jesus' ministry everybody in his ministry left him except 12 people? And I'm not sure. That the only thing they said is, he said, will you leave also? They said, where will we go? They didn't have anywhere else to go. You're the one that has the words of life. In other words, they, they're kind of like, there ain't nowhere else to go. Everybody else is gone. But he says, speak this. Exhort people and rebuke them with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And then he, said, then he, gets, he starts giving closing commandments. We're going to finish this book. Wow. Put them, that is the people, in mind to be subject to the principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, 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 to be ready to every, I'm, I'm a vinyl. Leaders got hung up. Be ready to every good work. To be ready. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and even envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men, that's the third time he's used it, appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Now, we don't get saved because we earn it. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't come into the kingdom because you did everything right. But once you're in the kingdom, you need to be, you need to be doing stuff that's right. You're now empowered. Grace now empowers you to live the way that you couldn't live before. But you still got to cooperate with it. Um, but according to it, it's not a works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace. Now, there's another place about says he's justified by faith. Which is it? They work in conjunction. There's the God side, the man side. The God side is he's made the provision. The, the man side is he receives it by faith. Amen. See, somebody could take that scripture right off the deep end and forget that we're justified by faith. They do work together. It is by grace through faith. Amen? It's by faith that it might be, and one scripture says it, it is by faith that it might be by grace. They're, they're, they become inseparable in this. Why? There's a God side, the man side. So you've got to read the whole so you don't get mixed up. You take this one, oh, I'm saved by grace. Woo! I don't even have to confess. No! The same Paul wrote and said that you, you're saved by confessing as Lord, believing in your heart, God's raising from the dead. That, be, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Never say constantly. That they that believe in God. Stop. How many believe in God? All right. Might be careful to maintain your love walk. I'm just being, I'm being, I'm being sarcastic right now. You see, when we, when we get a, as I, I like my friend Guy Dunnick says, when we get a narrative and we try to force everything into that narrative, we get out of balance. All we need is love, 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 love. And you can't deal with other scriptures like this that said that you're to affirm to all people. Amen? You're to affirm constantly, Titus, to all those people you're, you're establishing in these churches, these, these elders and these people. You're, you're going to be kind of the overseer in that area. And you need to tell them, you need to constantly affirm that they that have believed in God 
might be careful to maintain good works. Why? These things are good and profitable unto men. We're to maintain, we're to be taught to maintain good works. Not it automatically happens because you got saved. Or because you're under grace. Or because you got the love of God in you. It does not automatically happen. You're, you're to be taught to maintain that. Good works. We're to teach you that you need to maintain good works. That means I have to say, Daniel, you need to go out and help feed the poor. You need to maintain that in your life. Daniel, other Daniel, you need to go share Jesus with people. Every day, everywhere you are, you need to maintain that. I am to teach you to maintain good works. I'm to affirm, constantly affirm you that you need to maintain good works. I'm not going to get up here and, and, and blow wind up your skirt and tell you, and in, in Dana's case, they wear skirts. The Samoans. <laughs> Just messing with you. You know what I had to do on my phone? I put Dan hyphen, oh, I call him Dano, like Hawaii 5 I call him Dano, and Siri would not call Dano. I'd say, call Dano. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Dan, oh, would you like for me to look on the internet? And I'm, I'm, I'm on speakerphone in the car. I'm trying to not have to take my hands off. Finally, I went in and put his nickname in, the Samoan. Now I said, call the Samoan. It says, call him Dano. <laughs> Ah, technology. I will that thou affirm constantly they which, have, which have believed in God, they might be careful. That means you need to be attentive to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And now Paul, when I shall send Artemis, now we're not talking about Artemis, Gordon from the wild, wild west. Okay, Artemis, unto thee, Antiochus, be diligent to come unto me in Nicopolis, for I will determine to there to winter. Bring Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn, listen, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee, greet them with love, that love us in the faith. Grace be unto you all, amen. I wonder what he said to the people who didn't love him. <laughs> he just said, greet the ones that love us. <clears throat> amen. Y'all get, get anything out of that? Hallelujah. All right. Next week we start 1 Timothy. Okay? These are the last two epistles of Paul. And um, the second Timothy is written right before he, he, he's, he is executed. You know, it's his last letter before his execution. So, um, you know, when you kind of, you, I, I kind of read 2 Timothy and get near the end when he starts giving his, you know, Greetings and, and, you know, and salutations and so forth. It just kind of almost breaks your heart. These are, these are the last words. These are the last words of the aged apostle to his number one protege before he goes home to be with the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.